So I'm going to open up. I'm going to just, just stay with your hand on Romans 1. And uh, it's a great thing to bring your Bible to church, by the way. I know a lot of people read uh, electronic, electronically, and that's cool too. But I just, it's good to you know, be like the Bereans, search out in the Scripture what I say, and dig it out yourself. Amen? One of the greatest ways I grew when I first got saved was just getting into the Word and digging out uh, all these truths that I was hearing. Amen? So I'm going to talk about truth this morning and starting a whole series we're calling Taboo because there are certain taboo things that, like, we're not supposed to speak about as a church, according to society, but I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to lay the foundation this morning by talking about truth and how truth has been lost in our society and how we can regain it. Just simple, simple stuff this morning. But uh, I want to read, first of all, a couple verses here, and then we'll go back and work through the passage, verses 18 through 32. So Romans 1, verse 24 Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. How many knows truth is important? We don't want to be like the popular meme right now that's going around that says, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. In this passage, what Paul is doing is he's presenting the gospel to a people that he's never met before. He's presenting the gospel to the Romans. He's getting ready to visit Rome, but he hasn't been there yet. And so before he goes, he writes this very lengthy letter and what's interesting is, is you would think to people he had never met before, he would send like the simple gospel light version of what he's preaching. But he didn't do that. He sent the gospel heavy version. Because Romans is arguably the most theological, most weighty, most complex letter in the New Testament. I love it, by the way. I absolutely love the book of Romans. But... Um, He's sending this heavy message to the church before he gets there. And he's telling them about the gospel. You know, the word gospel means good news. So he's telling them about the gospel. In fact, if you look at the verses right before verse 18 in this passage, he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So this is what he's talking about. And I think he's countering an argument because he's obviously writing primarily to non-Jews who, we call, who are called Gentiles in the New Testament. So he's writing primarily to Gentiles and, and maybe they had this argument. Hey, Paul, God can hold you and the Jews responsible for things because you're Jews and you had a relationship with God and God chose you And you had the Ten Commandments, you had the Torah, you had all of this information, and maybe you can be held responsible, but how can we be held responsible? We didn't have all that data. And maybe this is what Paul's responding to. So what he's going to show here is how all people are held accountable, both Jews and Gentiles, and how there is no excuse, that no person is without an excuse because all can be held accountable. And so what he starts talking about is he talks about the wrath of God. The wrath of God. So this isn't a pleasant subject, but it is a Bible subject. The great theologian J.I. Packer said, the subject of divine wrath has become taboo. To talk about it has become taboo in modern society. He said, and Christians by and large have accepted the taboo and conditioned themselves never to raise the matter. But in actuality, the Bible says more about wrath than it does love. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And when we think about wrath, we think about someone who's uncontrollable, someone who flies off the handle and just goes crazy and starts throwing pots and pans. But that's never happened in your house. So. But anyhow, that's not quite the biblical view of wrath. Because in the Old Testament... 
The Bible said God is slow to anger. And so His wrath is truly a response to the wickedness of humanity. So God doesn't fly into a rage like sinful people would. But God's anger works over the long haul. His wrath works over the long haul. And what He's doing is He's responding to unrighteousness or unholiness. God is perfectly holy. He is perfect in all of His ways. And so there's no unrighteousness that can dwell in His presence. There's no sin that can dwell in His presence and not be dealt with. He won't just sweep it under the table. He won't just act like it didn't happen. It won't just be out of sight, out of mind to Him. There is a recompense for the sin of men. And so there are felt needs and there are real needs in our lives. And often we preach on the felt need categories. And that's fine. I think we should. But the real need Paul is bringing out here is you're all condemned and judgment is ahead of you. You better get it right. Chapter 1. He starts with it in chapter 1 of Romans. You're all under the condemnation of wrath. And not only is there a future wrath, there's a hell. You know, the Bible talks about hell. And hell isn't a place of annihilation where you go and you just burn up because Jesus said it's a place where the worm dies not. And it isn't just a a kind of an ethereal, ghost-ridden place where you just, we walk around and haunt people. Because the Bible says that there's a great gulf fix between us and the dead. We can't go to them. They can't come to us. And so if you're getting visited by loved ones, it very well could be a demonic spirit. And when we go consult witches and mediums and palm readers and fortune tellers to try to contact the realm of the dead, then we're, we're we're really committing the sin of necromancy, which is against the book of Leviticus, because we're doing it in an unlawful manner. And what happens when we get into that? God did gave us these laws to protect us. What happens when we do that is we're actually entering into the spirit realm. Because Paul talks about three heavens. There's the first heaven, the atmospheric heaven. There's the second heaven. And then there's the third heaven, which is the abode of God. Now, the first heaven is where we live. The second heaven is the realm of Satan and his demonic forces, and I believe it's the realm of warfare. And the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. So Satan isn't in hell today, no matter what the cartoons told us when we were growing up. He isn't in hell. He's on planet earth. He's on planet earth roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Even God asked Satan in the book of Job, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and fro on the earth. I've been walking. Rex, it's good to see you, my friend. It's been, I've been going to and fro on planet earth. And so Satan dwells in this really, I say this second heaven. But God is in the third heaven. So any attempt of man in his own power to get to God really gets fouled up in the second heaven. So it really gets messed up. So chanting on in front of crystals on a rock in Sedona, Arizona, or moving to Asheville, which I love, by the way. My wife told me, she said, if I ever pass away, you're going to be in Asheville living in a tent, eating your herbs and drinking your juices. <laughs> Not a bad idea, but anyhow, it is a hippie town. It, I'm, I don't know, you know, you... <laughs> Any attempt of ours to get to God gets fouled up in the demonic realm. That's why it took one coming from the third heaven down to earth to make a way. That's why the Bible calls Jesus the pathfinder or the way maker in Hebrews. He comes down and he made a way so you and I could follow his way back up to the abode of God and contact God. This is why transcendental meditation, you know, I believe in biblical meditation, which is like ruminating in the book of Hebrews Meditate on my word day and night, and I'll cause you to have good success. Don't blank out your mind and chant the name of a Hindu god. That's dangerous. 
when you blank out your mind, why well, I don't believe in hypnosis? Because you're giving your power of your mind over to someone else, and you're opening the gate of your mind up. I could go on and on and on here, but let's save it for another day, all right? The, the issue is there is a real heaven, a real hell, a real wrath to come, but what Paul says is there's a wrath right now. There's a wrath right now on humanity. And it's the wrath of abandonment. That when you go your way, God backs up and lets you go your way. Eventually. And it becomes this wrath of abandonment. Okay, let's dig into this. Look back with me. Let's read this entire passage. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For I am not... A, sorry, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and unrighteousness of men, or ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now that term suppress, it's like you being in a swimming pool with a beach ball and you try to push it under the water. It doesn't work. It's coming back on you. So men are trying their best to suppress the truth. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being, mis being understood rather by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's saying everyone should know there's a God just by looking at creation. So even those who are non-Jews who don't have the law or didn't have the law and didn't have the Ten Commandments of the Torah, you're still without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passion. For even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, or as Old King James says, reprobate to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. And then he gives us a laundry list of unrighteous deeds. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are not deserving or are deserving rather of death, not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. The message translates that last portion in a very interesting way. Since they did not bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell broke loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, bickering and cheating. Look at them, mean-spirited, venomous, fork-tongued God-bashers, bullies, swaggerers, insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in, a, in, in the way Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They perfectly well, they know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face and they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do worse things best. There's really a progression here in Paul's thought. First of all, people reject the truth. And then after they reject the truth, 
they turn away from God. After they turn away from God, they turn to immorality and all kinds of sins. And after that, if they don't repent, God eventually gives them over to their choices. And then we see a manifestation of these choices described in Paul's writings. There's these, step, this, these steps downward for people who don't believe the truth. The first is there's an indifference because they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful. Things of God, be, you became, they became indifferent to the things of God. They lacked interest in them. And then they became blind in their futile uh, thoughts. They became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were dark and professing to be wise, they became fools. So there was this desperate search that ensued, trying to find anything and everything to replace God in that empty heart. And then there's eventually the loss of God Himself. That they forsake God and God turns them over to the final thing which is complete idolatry. And Paul uses this term, God gave them up, He gave them up, He gave them over. First of all, He gave them up, verse 24, to uncleanness. Akatharia in Greek, which is usually sexual impurity. It's used so many times in that context. He gave them over just to sexual immorality and impurity. And then verse 26, He gave them to vile passions, which was homosexuality. He eventually gave them to these vile passions, women lusting after women and men lusting after men. And then He finally gives them over to a debased or reprobate mind to where now all things are lawful and don't tell me what to do because I'm going to do whatever I want to do. J.B. Phillips translated this at like this. They gave up God, so God gave them up. So the principle is when men lose God, they lose themselves. They lose who they were created to be. C.S. Lewis answered the question one time, how could God send people to hell? And his response basically was, God doesn't do that. Hell is the answer that you've been looking for your whole life, and that is I want nothing to do with God, so God gives you what you want for eternity. And then Paul lays out three different case studies. Three different case studies of what a life of depravity looks like. There is sexual immorality, homosexuality, and total depravity. And so we get to the bottom line of this, and it becomes a total reversal of value a total rejection of truth. And now true logic and rationale that should bring you to the highest truth according to the Greek philosophers now is thrown away. But I want you to hear this loud and clear. The true culprit isn't sexual immorality or homosexuality or, sec or, or all kinds of immorality. The, those things aren't the true culprits, though they're all wrong. The true culprit is people have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The true culprit is we have rejected truth and thrown truth in the garbage pail and when that happens, there's a complete digression with the morality of humankind. And now I think we are, you know, I taught a seminar several years ago for a Presbyterian church on, on worldviews. And at the end of this thing, I was teaching about worldviews and I was teaching about the descent and decay of a society. And I got down to the last thing, and I talked about tolerance. And, and what we've had in our society is an entrance of extreme tolerance, I'm going to call it. Because tolerance is a virtue. Tolerance means I'll sit at the table and hear your point of view and value you. I may disagree with you, but I can listen to you and value your point of view, just, and you should listen to my point of view and value my point of view. That's how we have a civilized society, that's what our founding fathers told us to do. We sit at a table civilly and listen to each other and express our opinions, and that's what we're taught to do. However, we're living in such a tolerance-saturated age, but it's ironic that if you get online, no one's tolerant of anybody. Because if you disagree with me, I'm going to cancel you, or I'm going to rip you whether I have a relationship with you or not. That's intolerance, my friends. But extreme tolerance teaches us we should accept everything and never speak against anything 
or will be canceled. And if we come to the table claiming to have absolute truth, we really are the most wicked of all people. And we're supposed to accept any lifestyle and any moniker and any name and any label in the, in the name of tolerance. That's not right. It's not Bible. And I'm coming against it in Jesus' name. A man named Rick Thomas mapped out this digression of Romans 1 and he said it goes like this. People wanted to do something that was perhaps a lifestyle choice. And so they analyzed what is the right thing to do. And then after that, they may have sought help in making their decision or not. And then they came to the decision, I'm going to suppress the truth of God. I'm going to push God's truth out of my life We'll push the Christian community's opinion out of my life because they hold the truth. I want to push away the conviction of the Holy Spirit out of my life. And then when you do that, God is no longer for you. Romans 8.31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? If you push Him out of your life, He's no longer fighting for you. Because how can He stand with untruth? And so then His wrath begins to come on you. And then, if you continue down that path, your thinking becomes futile and dark. And then this pathway to disobedience has become, and you make an exchange. You exchange the truth for a lie. You push aside God and His Word, and you take the lie, and then when you do that, you become desensitized to the truth of God. And if you do that enough in your life, you will become calloused to the truth of God. If you do that enough in your life, you'll start thinking the wrong thing is the right thing. And the right thing is the wrong thing. And you have a completely upside down understanding of what truth is. So though the person has suppressed God's truth out of his life, his conscience is still active in responding to this wrong choice. So the only way for him to get rid of his sin is by repentance. But if that is not an option, he must begin a process of re-scripting his conscience so he can fully exchange the truth of God for a lie. Wow. So this is where we are, I think, in society. In what really, really really pushed me over the edge to preach on this was recently when our youth leaders started going into the high schools and middle schools, reaching kids and just being a hope for kids. And they came back and told me some of the stories that they've encountered, and it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind that post-COVID, we have generations now that It's almost like it, 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 they're so far from the shore, somebody's got to throw out a lifeline. And it's not going to happen by us appeasing. It's not going to happen by us becoming extremely tolerant and petting every petty belief. It's only going to come through preaching truth and preaching it straight and preaching it strong. When I entered a church as a 16-year-old, I didn't know nothing about the Bible. I didn't know God. I had had an experience with God on my own. But thank God I didn't attend church, and they told me. I Thank God they didn't tell me I was okay. Thank God they didn't tell me, listen, brother, everything's good, and all that you're involved in in your life is going to be good, and God loves you no matter how you are. No, they preach straight hell, fire, consequence of sin, And it broke me down. It broke my will and broke my spirit. And then when you're broken like that, God can do something in your life. God can come in and rescue you and rebuild your personality and rebuild your soul. God can come in and bring new life into you where there's death and a desert and desolation. God can come back and resurrect. I've had people, come on, man. We had a lady in our church in in, uh, the Northern Virginia area who had come out of a Hindu background, and she said, but we were Hindu, but we loved watching Joel Osteen. 
And she said, then one night I had a dream. I thought, well, I can have Jesus added on to all of my Hindu gods. Then she said, one night I had a dream. And in the dream, all of these gods were placed upon the table. And then a hand from heaven came down and smashed them all. And she realized Jesus was the only way to salvation. The only way. Sometimes it takes a hard no. It takes a hard wake-up call before we wake out of the calloused malaise and this funk that everybody's walking in. Sometimes I read stuff online and it blows. I stopped watching a lot of news because it got so illogical. Just illogical and crazy. I'm, I'm ranting right now, and I'm meant to stay to the text, but look at your neighbor and say, pray for him. I'm going to give you three ways, three ways to get back and recover truth, and they are just as simple, and they're pure gospel. Number one, we got to understand that all people are under sin, okay? Romans 3, verse 9. What then, are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Paul said, we're, con- we're, we're, we're pointing our finger at every one of you, Jews and Gentile. You all are under this curse of sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have t- uh, together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery. And they went on and on and on. Everyone is under the curse of sin. Everyone, St. Francis of Assisi used this Latin term, incurvitus. Everyone is bent towards sin. The only one who was born who wasn't that way was Jesus himself. And he lived a sinless life so that we could have a perfect sacrifice. But the problem with many people and the problem with witnessing to people in America now is no one's lost anymore. You're okay, I'm okay, and everybody's okay. And if you're okay, I can't help you. Because if you 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 got to understand your fallen condition and the depravity of your soul before you can receive the gospel message. That's why the Bible says when Peter preached, they were pricked in their hearts. The message comes like a hammer and a fire, Jeremiah said. And it comes with convicting power that breaks down the will of man. And it breaks us down to where we say, God, I need you. And without you, I'm lost and undone. I need you more than anything. We shouldn't have to follow up one person because you should be so desperate for God that you're waiting when we open these doors on Sunday morning. We shouldn't have to advertise one meeting. You should be packing this place out with police out here directing the way because you know without God you're headed for a devil's hell. But we've tried to do everything and pacify and placate and pet and try to get everybody into something that's going to save them from an eternity and take the death sentence off their lives. My God, help me this morning. All of us are sold under sin, as Paul said in Romans 7. The second truth is the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It isn't... I, there's no philosophy, there's no self-help book, there's no 12-step program I can take you through that's going to give you salvation power. The only thing that provides salvation power is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why people are trying to deconstruct Scripture and revision Uh, take the revisionism approach to Scripture and water down Scripture and so talk about contextualization of Scripture that we water it down to meaning nothing. Um, And this is where a lot of our denominations are today. They've so watered down the Bible, there's no more power left. I have a friend in central North Carolina who pastors a great church, and I've preached there, and he said he was doing these uh, community meetings with other pastors, and there were some pastors in this meeting, part of one of the came out of one of the greatest universities in North Carolina. And he said, we were sitting there talking, and it was nearing Easter. And he said, we were talking about what our churches are doing for Easter. And these guys looked at my friend and said, listen, man, do you actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead? 
They said, we know it's all symbolic. It's type and shadow. It's, it's a symbolic thing. And my friend said, I didn't go back anymore to the luncheons. There was a young man in this area who came and wanted to have uh, coffee with me, and he, he was recommended to me by some people, a young pastor on fire for God, and had an evangelist heart. I just loved talking to the guy. And he said, my denomination sent me to a school to be, you know, to receive minister's training. And as soon as I got there, there was a professor who came out and said, well, first of all, all of these stories of the Old Testament are just mythology. And he was like, what? And then went into chapel that day, and this lady professor is the one who preached on Moses. And he said, how could I listen to her preach on Moses if she just said he was a myth in the Old Testament? I'm telling you, when we get to the Bible is just mythology, then we've lost all... I, I spent most of my life in academic studies, and I love it, but I tell you, I'm up to here with a lot of it. There are godly men and women doing scholarship, and I thank God for them, but there's so much deconstructionism that we've just so totally taken all power and authority out of the Scripture. Listen, I believe every word of it. I believe every word of it was written for Hans Hess. I'm that wild. I believe every bit. I believe in it is the power of God to set people free. It's not my great messages that set you free, but it's the Holy Ghost that hooks onto my messages, that gets into your heart and reads your thoughts and intents and starts breaking down that will and interjects His life and authority into you. That's what gets people born again. That's what changes a nation. It was a Jonathan Edwards preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. It was some men who believed in wailing and wailing and weeping between the porch and the altar and calling on God and putting Him first place. This is what brings life change to people's life. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The third thing that we need to realize to recover truth, and this is simple gospel, is that Jesus is the only way. We can't recover truth just through a program. We can't recover truth through some other faith or religion. It's Jesus is the only way. This is an exclusive gospel. People talk about inclusivity. I'm going to talk about exclusivity. It's an exclusive gospel. You don't bring your junk and add Jesus onto it. You don't bring in your 14 other gods and add Jesus onto it. He takes first place. He takes primacy in your life. He takes over the throne room of your life. He said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And not only does you, did he say you're going to know the truth, he said I am the way and I am the truth. So truth now has been personified in the person of the Son of God. If you want truth, my brother, my sister, just ask Jesus inside and let Him come and do what no other man can do. Let Him come and renovate you top to bottom. He who is in Christ is a new creation. For the old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. You don't come in with all of your unholiness and continue that way. It stops, brother when it meets the truth of God's power. God renovates you, sanctifies you, cleanses you, washes you. There's still power in the blood to wash away every sin. There's still power in the blood to change a hardened heart. There's still power in the blood to change your thinking and change your affections. Come on, somebody give him a praise. Hallelujah. Woo! Somebody give him a shout. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Look at your neighbor say, truth shall make you free. All right, let me finish this thing. He says this in Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, which God set forth as a propitiation by His blood. I, I, I love different Bible versions, but I love preaching from a literal version because that word propitiation is left in it. It's a beautiful Greek term. The term means 
the appeasement of divine wrath by a sacrificial offering. The appeasement of divine wrath by a sacrificial offering. How do we get that sentence of wrath off of us? By going to the sacrifice that God gave us. Going to the propitiation. Listen, it's only mentioned one other time in the New Testament. That's in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5 where Paul said, and over the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle or the temple, over the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. What's he talking about? There was a, an Ark of the Covenant. Come on, Indiana Jones. There was an Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant was the place where God dwelt in the Old Testament. Now He dwells in the hearts of all of us. But it's interesting, that Ark of the Covenant had a golden lid. And that lid was called the mercy seat. Thank God for mercy. Hallelujah. It was the mercy seat. And over that mercy seat is where the glory of God dwelt. Now one time a year, the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place if he was without sin. Tradition tells us that they tied a rope around his ankle so, and put bells on him so the other priest could see if he was going to be struck dead or not. If the bell stopped ringing, they knew to pull that man out by the rope. So he went in once a year to the most holy place, and there he would take the blood of a lamb, a spotless sacrifice, and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on top of that mercy seat, and God would be appeased. His wrath would be for one year. He would be, the sins of Israel would be forgiven for one year. There was a time stamp on it. But the Bible says in Hebrews that when Jesus died and rose from the dead, that somehow he ascended into the heavenlies. Somehow he went into the holy of holies in the heavenlies. And there he sprinkled his blood on the eternal mercy seat of God. And this time it had no time signature to it. He said, when I sprinkle my blood on the mercy seat, it means the forgiveness of sins forever and ever and ever. Now he, whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. And each person who comes now and accepts that sacrifice, all of their sins are forgiven and cast into the sea of forgetfulness. This is the way to recover truth. It's the gospel. It has never changed. It's still the same way. Whatever you're facing, truth is the way out. Whatever you're bound by, truth is the way out. Whatever others are saying about you, truth is the way out. Whatever the enemy is telling you, truth is the way out. Satan comes as an angel of light and tries to speak lies in a deceptive manner, but the truth of God can cut him down in an instant. Hallelujah. Satan operates in darkness, God operates in light. Satan operates in untruths, God operates in truth. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. One more thing and we're going to pray. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, there were three different temptations that Satan brought against him. The first was, Jesus had been praying and fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the first temptation was, if you are the Son of God, Command these stones to be made bread. First of all, it was a temptation for Jesus, I think, to question his identity. If you are who you say you are, then why don't you do something about it? Satan comes to us with the same kind of garbage. If you are a Christian, then why is all this blowing up in your life? If you are a Christian, why don't your kids act better? If you are a Christian, why did you do that thing that was just plain stupid? Satan comes and tries to cut down our identity in Christ. Then he says, command these stones to be made bread. He came against the physical desire, the physical wants of Jesus. And here's the thing about all three temptations. It's an issue of priority, where you place God in your life. Jesus could have said, okay, the Father, I'm going to serve the Father anyhow, but I'm going to go ahead and make some bread right now because I'm really starved. And he could have put the Father kind of in second place. But Jesus didn't do that. What he did is he came, to, came at Satan with the truth. 
And he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Boom. And then he comes at him and he takes him to the highest point on the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he says, cast yourself down for doesn't Psalm 91 say that he'll give his angels charge over you concerning all of your ways and and he'll, he'll rescue you lest you dash your foot against the stone. So it was a temptation for Jesus to use his power in an unauthorized manner. And Jesus had no part of it. He said, yeah, and it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then the final temptation was he took him on a high mountain and he offered him the kingdoms of this earth. And he says, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you'll just bow down and worship me. And this was a shortcut to the suffering servant route that Jesus had been called to. And he recognized it and discerned it and he came against him with the truth. And he said, no, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Get thee behind me, Satan. He countered every temptation with the truth. I'm telling you, your way out is the truth. The the remedy for this society is gospel truth. The remedy for our kids in schools is gospel truth. I'm telling you, reasoned and rational and on fire in the Holy Ghost, truth. The remedy for America is the church. The church that won't be afraid to preach the truth and stand for the truth and declare Jesus is the only way get everything else out of the church let Jesus be the Lord of the church once again get rid of all the other junk open the doors to the power of the Holy Ghost let the wind of the Spirit blow in our lives again the cure for your family is on your knees the cure for your marriage is on your knees opening up your hearts once again to the Father and saying come and heal this thing Lord Jesus Woo! Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, one more thing and we're going to pray. I had a couple of years ago in our church and they had gone through marriage problem after marriage problem after marriage problem. And they finally came to the point where they said, we're just going to get a divorce. We, this, is, this is crazy. And then they heard about a marriage seminar happening in a town not too far from them. So they went to this marriage seminar. Well, what it really turned out to be was a deliverance seminar. Short form for that is get all the demons out of your life seminar. And they showed up and went through this get all the demons out of your life seminar and their marriage was totally healed. Today they are an amazing couple doing amazing things for God. They were ready to give up and had tried, I think, counseling and everything else. And I appreciate counseling. I'm a a fan of it. But nonetheless, it took hard truth. It took your rebellious attitude is of Satan. Repent and get rid of it. You wanting everything and you being the prima donna in your marriage is of the enemy. Get rid of it and become a servant of your husband or wife. Come on, serve them as Christ loves the church and serve the church. I mean, come on, let's just get truth back and we're going to see freedom happen again in our nation. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. Let's all stand. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. If if there's anyone in here and you're not right with God, this was your message today. Number one, if if you're not right with God, you better get it right. Because I told you, my heart's, my conscience clear. There's a hell coming. There's judgment on your life right now if you're not right with God. So my conscience is clear. I'm going to go eat lunch and drink tea and enjoy myself. Because I've I've borne my soul to you. So if you're not right with God, you better get it right. Here's the good news. All it takes is surrendering your heart to Jesus right now. That's it. This is better than any multi-million dollar inheritance you could get from a grandma. This is eternity. This is joy unspeakable and full of glory. This is life more abundantly. This is peace like you've never known it in your life. And all it takes is opening up your heart, breaking down your will and saying yes to Jesus. If you're in here this morning and you want prayer like that, I want to see your hand just between me, you and the Lord. I'm not calling you out. 
I'm not going to embarrass you, but just between me, you, and Jesus, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Maybe there's some of you in here and you, you've been raised in church, but you've really grown cold. You've, you've basically backslidden on that commitment. And you heard this message this morning and you realize, my gosh, I better get it right. If that's you, we want to pray for you. Let me see your hand this morning. We're going to pray for you. Come on, everybody, under the sound of my voice, pray with me. Father, I surrender my life to Jesus. Come and open up my spirit. I repent of all sin. I repent of a calloused heart. Forgive me of the times I failed you. Forgive me of the lies I've believed. But right now, I accept the truth. Jesus, come be the Lord of my life. Change everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Come on now, can we lift our hands right now and just give Him praise? Hallelujah.